Good afternoon. I'm here with uh, Mitch Lasky of Benchmark Partners. Anyway, um, we're here to discuss uh, zigging where other people zag. In other words, where are the investments in, in classic game investment that um, can produce greater rewards because you are not competing against the pack. Mitch, as I think most of you know, is, uh, has been an investor in games since he started at Benchmark in 2007. His exits include Riot Games, um, Natural Motion, and Gaikai. Um, but we're here to discuss what he's doing on a forward basis. He's also um, invested in some other companies, Cyanogen, which if you follow the Android space is looking to be the red hat for Android, and Snapchat, which uh, famously turned down Mark Zuckerberg's $3 billion offer. No comment. No comment. Um, so I want to ask Mitch, we've had an array of opinions at this show of people, uh, people saying games are great, and especially their investments are great, to Rick Thompson saying, if you aren't already in the games field, don't even, don't, don't even bother investing, you'll, get your, you'll, you'll lose your money. But you know, Mitch, you're looking at several billion dollar, things that have billion dollar perspective values, so please tell us why you're fucking around with games. <laughs> That's actually a very good way to put it. Um, I think, look, the, the principal answer to that question is um, a bit historical. It, I, I mean, I, I grew up in the games business, more or less. I was in the games business for 20 years before becoming a venture capitalist. It's a space I know very well. It's a space where I feel very comfortable judging good from bad. Um, and so I think that, that in, you know, in, in the nobody knows anything world of venture capital, that, that's a, a, a nice place to start. I think games have attributes, however, which make them very interesting in certain circumstances as venture investments. There's the potential for network effects. There's the potential for early monetization um, and, and therefore the, the, the need for potentially less capital over time than you might need in some other kind of an investment in a, in a similar or, or different space. So um, I think all of those things taken together uh, you know, make it a place that I, I continue to go back to to look for um, for new and exciting ideas. Um, I think we'll talk about this probably more in, in the context of, of what's interesting in the, in the current context, but one of the problems with the games business is that you know, these, these moves into new areas, these, these new ideas, very quickly become areas of, of intense competition. So it's a, it's a tough place to, uh, to invest for that reason because very often you, know, you, you, you get into these markets where uh, there's already entrenched comp competition. So. Okay, so uh, clearly one of the reasons is that you have comfort and knowledge of the space, but we want to discuss why, uh, you know, again, why it takes your, why it's worth taking your very valuable time. So let's break, let's break this down. When we first had this discussion in 2009, your observation, since the default investment is the lottery ticket investment on getting a good team and, and uh, hoping that it will produce a massive hit. Yeah. And massive hits do produce billion dollar returns, but the, but the number of ones that come out the funnel are perhaps one versus about several hundred investments. Mm -hmm. So what you said in 2009 was distribution was the underinvested area. Can you nominate a couple of candidates now in 2014? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think let's take, take a step back. Obviously, the big, the, sort of the big hits in the, in the space, the big exits, um, you know the, the billion dollar exits, which oddly have all come out of Europe most more most recently, have been primarily content companies. When you think about it, right? It's you know King, Supercell, Mojang um, are fundamentally content companies. Now they're all they're also they also have other attributes we can talk about that make them very interesting. But um, the, I found just historically those are very difficult companies to invest in, um, and and I think I have a better than than average sense of kind of what makes a hit. Um, and I still feel like it's a bit of a lottery ticket investment, as you say. Um, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. And frankly, the value of those companies is so intrinsically dependent on the amount of cash flow that they can, that they can uh, generate that if, if, you, if you get a near hit but not a, not a true hit, it's very hard for me as the investor to, to, to find a way to make a return. I think what I've historically tried to do is invest in companies that are content plus something else, where the content is an accelerant. The content is something that 
helps, for example, make the customer acquisition more fluid and more, and more inexpensive, but that the real value is, is elsewhere, whether it's technology, whether it's community, whether it's the dreaded word platform, um, some aspect like that, that I think I can point to and say, look, this company deserves a higher multiple, for example, than, it, than, a, than a similar company that's, that's only doing content. So I think in the current environment, look, the, uh, what, is the, what is the area of the, mo of the most intense and brutal competition? To me, looking at the market right now, it's not, what you can, it's not what kind of games you can make. It's not a genre issue. It's customer acquisition. Um, that's the area, I, I, again, when I was in the packaged goods business, um, if we spent 25% of revenue on marketing, we would get called into Bobby Kotick's office. I see Julian Lynn Evans here. He's like shaking his head, yeah. Uh, and we would get beaten with a stick. Um, it, I think, you know, you look at now, I see companies that are spending 70, 80% of trailing 30 days revenue on customer acquisition. And to me, that's a, that, that feels like an area where uh, some kind of a blue ocean move um, would, would, is, 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 is imminent. You're being kind. Many of these companies are spending multiple hundreds of percent of trailing thirty-year, uh, trailing thirty-day <laughs> revenues. So, if you were to choose, so customer acquisition is your classic red ocean. So, let's look at blue. Let's look at blue ocean. So, the riot component was community. It was com yeah. It was. I mean, there was a pre-existing community there that that we felt was being vastly underserved by the existing Defense of the Ancients product. Um, Brandon and Mark came to us with this idea that they could take what was essentially a mod for Warcraft 3 and turn it into a standalone product, um, and that there was a global audience for it. And um, more, more interestingly, and, and I, again, I think the, the move that we found so intriguing was to bring a, an, what had historically been primarily an Asian uh, concept, which was virtual, like a hardcore game monetizing through virtual goods. And we had seen in, in, in Zynga and in some early mobile games lightweight games, ca casual games, monetizing through virtual goods. But frankly, there hadn't really been a lot of good examples of core games. And, and there was a real sense back then, it's funny to think about it now in retrospect, there was a sense back then that the core gamer hate, would hate the idea of, of monetization through virtual goods, that it, was, it would be considered in, in, you know, in some way kind of creepy and, 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 and aggressive in a way that would, that would turn them off. And it turned out to be exactly the opposite. I and mean, that company's going to do three quarters of a billion dollars in revenue or better this year. Okay, that was four years ago. How is community going forward? Is that one of the areas that you would recommend that people look forward or are those opportunities fished out? No, I mean, I, I, it, it's interesting, again, you know, to go back to 2004. I've, I've written on a number of occasions about how I really felt like 2004 was the pivot year in the video game business. Um, it was the year, I, and not for this reason, but I took my company public, the first mobile games company on NASDAQ. It was the year that uh, World of Warcraft launched. It was the year Steam launched. Um, it was the year that Shonda and Tencent went public. Um, so a, a real interesting sort of watershed year in the video game business. It was also, uh, you know, a, a year that's conveniently 10 years ago, so it's kind of fun to look back and, and think about it. So if 10 years ago you had looked at the, the top 10 non-sports games by, by revenue for that, for, the, for that year, for 2004 or 2003, um, you would have maybe seen one game, World of Warcraft, that looked modern right, that looked like a community, uh, sort of subscription-based, sort of unusual revenue generation potential. Um, you look at the charts, and I, well, you and I just looked at them, actually. Right. Uh, we, we just looked at the chart for 2013, which were the top 20 grossing uh, video, game, uh, video games across all platforms, mobile. Non-sports. Non-sports, across mobile, uh, across PC, across console, et cetera. Um, Eight of, the t eight of ten of them had, were, were titles we could easily identify as having strong communities. Eight of ten of them were free to play. Um, Twelve of ten of them were launched not in 2013. Team. They were launched prior to 2013, which again, thinking back to the packaged goods days, that would have never happened. You would never have, I mean, maybe you'd have one year where some title that was launched in December would, would, would have a wave in the, in the following year. But, it was always a very much kind of you know, big box office launched type of business. So I think those three attributes, the, the sort of long engagement or massive repeatability, community, and, and free to play are sort of, I mean, they are, they are still basically the hallmarks of the modern hit. Right, if you look at the, if you look at the charts, you'll see that um, 
in the bottom 15, that is number 6 to 20, the majority are free to play. You still have the, la the you, know, yeah, you have Call of Duty, you have... You, but uh, those are in the top, those yeah. are the only... Uh, Final you still, Fantasy. You still have the last great, as the uh, packaged goods brands have all narrowed down to Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, Final Fantasy, but everything else is something that is behaving like a modern title. Yeah. So it's, changed, so it's changed over. So I think that's remarkable. And I think it's something that, that it doesn't get enough attention in, in the video game business, just, how, uh, just how, how much that's changed in the last decade. OK. So if you are looking to make go forward investments, um, all three of those still apply on go, on go forward? I think those three things are, just a, are, are essentially table stakes at, the, at, at this point. I think I don't, I don't really look at anything that's not either free to play or something, un something unconventional on the monetization side, something that doesn't at least have the potential to have a strong community. And, and again, that strong community is a proxy for the, the opportunity for viral distribution, for lowered customer acquisition costs, and for long-term engagement. Okay, well, casual games famously, as we discussed, do not tend to have the level of community that attach, and, and several of the ones have come out. So are you saying you wouldn't invest in a casual game? Not necessarily. If it had other attributes which contributed to the potential for a network effect. But, um, I, and, it, and this may just be my blind spot and my prejudice as an investor, but I tend to gravitate more toward the core. Right. Um, in other words, the games that you play and the games that you've produced, right. or that you and, know. Which is amusing, since I made most of, of my money as an entrepreneur in the casual, the casual industry, games. So, um, but go figure. Yeah, Tetris. I, I, Tetris did, is not exactly Tetris a. Tetris and Bejeweled. And Bejeweled are not exactly hardcore ga hardcore games, and so on. All right. Um, moving on. Let's talk about uh, about arbitrage which is another way in which you can make money, uh, significant money in venture investment. Mm -hmm. So where, where are the arbitrage opportunities? Um, and obviously, I'm not asking you to discuss anything you haven't yet laid a bet on. Yeah, I, I, I don't like the term arbitrage, really. I, it, it, it doesn't feel like, uh, it's not really a concept that I, that, that I really look at as an as a, as a attribute of, an, of a potential good investment. I know what you're talking about, though, um, and that is sort of where are the where are the inefficiencies in the current market that could be exploited. Um, and again, you know, I go back to, uh, you know, I think we were talking about this before we went on stage about uh, one of the other things that happened in 2004 was uh, Harvard Business Journal published a paper that I, I found very influential as an entrepreneur and also as an investor called Blue Ocean Strategy, um, and. That was also a decade ago. And, and I think while it's been very much kind of entered the popular imagination as you don't want to start businesses in areas of intense competition, you want to go to areas of, of, uh, that, are, that are more sort of open and blue and in the sense of, of not being filled with competitors, I think the piece of that article that people forget about is that the, the second pillar was uh, this, this, the, the blue ocean move is a simultaneous innovation on the vectors of value and cost. So you want, to, you want to increase value while lowering cost. Um, and that cost could be the, the cost to the end user, the cost of production, could be anything. And I think, uh, you know, so you, when you think about that in the current market, sort of what, what is the most obvious area? Well, we've taken most of the costs out of production. Um, you know, you, you, you go back to the packaged goods days, and, and we were spending $30 million making a, Christ, you know, a big Christmas title at Activision. That's not the case anymore. I mean, you can, um, um, some of these games that have gone on to generate billions of dollars of revenue the, the, from Supercell, from King, from others, I'm sure were made for you know, a, an order of magnitude less money than, than we would normally think of. So I think that's no longer really relevant. Um, right, Supercell famously claims that five people made Clash of Clans, and they, they ramped up to 10 when they went live. So yes, that's a little bit different than, 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 than Destiny. Than, than Destiny, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so I think that, that I wouldn't necessarily think that's that interesting. Again, I'll come back to the customer acquisition piece, where I feel like um, there is just an enormous amount of money being spent. Uh, I mean, those of you who are in the business and who are every day out there kind of competing for installs, uh, you, you all know how expensive it's gotten, how much competition there are from, from companies like King. I mean, I was looking at King's uh, public filings the other day, and uh, noticed that they had spent something like a half a billion dollars in customer acquisition uh, in trail, over trailing 12-month period. Like, that's a hell of a lot of money. And, it's, and if you're launching you know, a game onto the, onto the iOS charts, one of the 2,000 games that are being launched on, 
on iOS every month. Um, it's very hard to compete with, uh, with a company like that who can just sort of outspend you. And frankly, be, the ability to spend a lot of money efficiently on customer acquisition doesn't to me seem like a very good idea. So I'm, right. I'm looking for areas where, where, where there's leverage, where there's, you, to use your term, arbitrage, where there's the opportunity to get a title to market at vastly reduced costs and at scale. All right, well, let me try something else. By the way, with King, um, King over-indexed their acquisition in uh, late 2013, coincidentally, when they had the report numbers before they went IP, uh, IPO, so they were able to pay a premium. And Gree did it in 2012, and Facebook did it in 2011. The issue is King may not always overspend, but somebody will overspend, which is the issue that you get into. So let me choose a word. By the way, on that point, and it's completely unrelated to the games business, but I do not, for the life of me, understand why Apple and Google do not allow paid advertising in the Play stores, in the in, or, or in the or in the in in, in the iTunes store. Um, they could they could eviscerate Facebook's. Uh, mobile revenues overnight if they decided to do that. Um, it just shocks me that they would kind of let that, like that whole sort of incentivized install, paid install, CPI-based marketing business go to third parties when they could reclaim most of it in the App Store if, if, if they wanted to. Right, but as you've you know, as I discussed, Apple, you know, the App Store is in effect marketing for selling hardware. It's about three to five percent of their total revenues, so it may be that they're looking at the strategic purpose. But yes, there is a multi-billion-dollar business right there, and most importantly, crushing your enemy is yeah. is very attractive. Um, uh, and hearing the lamentation of their woman and all the all the quotes that you that you guys that you guys, that, that, that you guys know, so. Let's just talk about instead of arbitrage. Let's let's that's bad. That's bad speak. Let's switch to timing. You have shown a genius for timing, or at least you may say no comment. But with the sale of Gaikai to Sony and the sale of Natural Motion to Zynga, um, you know, obviously when you invest in something, you don't say this is the company I'm going after. But presumably there will continue to be timing opportunities coming up. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and I, I would say that. You know, I, I like to, I, I try to invest in companies, like I said, that, that have something other than simply the, the, the revenue and earnings that are being generated by the content as sort of value attributes. And I think, let's take Natural Motion as a good case in point. And Natural Motion had, uh, had an astonishing lead in 3D technology and in, and in motion graphics on the, um, on, on the mobile platforms. And I think that was very attractive to potential acquirers who wanted to leapfrog the current generation of games and maybe look to a future. So um, I, 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 that was obviously a thought of going in in terms of making the investment. Um, and I think you know, sim I had similar thoughts about Riot. I had similar thoughts about Gaikai. I had similar thoughts about some of the companies I've, I've currently invested in. Um, a, 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 I've recently invested in Genova Chen's company, uh, that games company. Uh, Genova uh, famously uh, did Journey, the, the game that came out as a download on PlayStation Network that won Game of the Year a couple of years ago, pretty much from every major publication. It's this intensely meditative, beautiful, almost artistic uh, game. I wouldn't have invested in that game. Right, right, because it looks the But I'm investing in his next game because his next game has a lot of these value attributes that I think are going to make it super valuable. So since the received wisdom, on the buzz in the field was it was an art project investment, but what you're saying is that you were true to your investment principles and we watched this space to see what his next game is. Absolutely. He's, he's, he's changing platforms. He's changing genres. He's, he's doing something incredibly ambitious. And, uh, and I think that that has the potential to be one of these sort of 10Xers uh, in a way that, you know, that perhaps his earlier projects, which were, uh, which were aimed at a, at a very different audience on a very different platform with very different monetization attributes, probably didn't. So check back in a year when we have something to talk about, when we sort out. So let's look at the overall landscape. Um, the most money is coming out of Asia right now. There were five IPOs in games last year. The, as Mitch referenced earlier, there were the last three billion dollar exits in games were in Europe. So is America designed to be the poor continent for games or, are there, or, 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 or is there still opportunity here? I think there's still opportunity here. I, I, you know, on the European point, it does, I, I do envy David Gardner's portfolio uh, over at London Ventures who, uh, who's just been hitting it out of the park in terms of being able to pick these, these sort of winners. But uh, no, I think there's a tremendous opportunity still here. I think one of the problems is we get caught up here in 
the, in, in, the, in the red ocean, if you will. We get caught up in the in the day-to-day -day competition, um, angling for, uh, you know, I'm gonna make an, I'm gonna make another MOBA for uh, for PC. I'm gonna make another match three game for uh, mobile or whatever, and 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 I'm gonna try and get it launched. And I'm and I I still have people coming to me to this day and asking me, saying, Hey, I made this game. It's it's doing okay, but it would really be great if you could give me five million dollars to market it. And I just want to throw those people out on the street, right? It's like the, it's the dumbest thing you could possibly say to me. So. Uh, you know th that still happens though, right? And I and I don't I don't find that as much from the Euro. I think they, there's a, there's more of a sophistication about the market from some of the European developers. And certainly, uh, you know, I've got a long history with with Tencent and with a number of the other Asian uh, publishers. And their level of sophistication, as you heard in the previous panel, um, their level of sophistication is astonishing. So the question about America was facetious, but the takeaway from what Mitch has said is invest in blue oceans, invest in things that do, it's a venture business, do things that have sustainable competitive advantage. And the herd seems to be getting it. Mitch, thank you very much for sharing thank with you. us. And thank you all for coming. Thanks.